Alright, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Wa alaikum assalam. Alhamdulillah wa salatu wa salam wa ala rasulillah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wa ba'd. So this is part two, right? Of speaking about Tawheed. And when we spoke about this the last time we met, we said that we wanted to understand both the philosophy that we have as Muslims of why we believe in Allah and being able to rationalize it and speak it out intelligibly to people who may come and ask, whether genuinely or antagonistically, you know, with enmity as to why we believe in the things that we believe. And part of the focus, of course, is that we don't just believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that He's the Creator and that's it. Because many other people, many other faiths, many other traditions have the claim that they believe in God and most will say that they believe in the one God. Even Hindus who practice uh, faithful and in their tradition, faithfulness to a number of deities, ultimately they believe they all funnel back to one God. And that's what the pagan Arabs at the time of the Prophet ﷺ were like. They said, listen, He's gathered all of our gods into the one God. And if you were to ask him, Allah says in Surah Al-Ankabut, They say, we believe in the one God, right? Uh, he is the one who created the heavens and the earth. So that isn't the criterion that divides us from other people. It's not that we believe in God, we believe in a deity, we believe in, in Allah, and everybody else doesn't. But what we believe about Allah is distinct, is unique. And that's why Tawheed is about focusing our knowledge of God into our worship of God. So the second level is not just recognizing that there is Allah, but now recognizing that it is only God, only the one God, the true God, who should be worshipped if we have come to suppose that he is subhanahu wa ta'ala, the one who is in charge, the creator, and Rabbul Alameen. And we broke down Surah Al-Fatiha in that regard. So we said that there were three levels of Tawheed. Tawheedul Rububiyyah and Tawheedul Uluhiyyah. But up here I have the word Tawheedul Ibadah. It's another word. So depending on where you read it or where you study, it'll say the Tawheed of Ibadah, the Tawheed, the focus of all worship only to Allah. What, how do we define the word worship? And I want you to circle that word, that word worship, in English and in the purpose of us as Muslims, people worship for important reasons. The word worship, the stemming of worship comes from three important factors. Either love or fear or hope. Even when you come to worship Allah later on today, we're going to pray Jum'ah together, right? And when you come up to Jum'ah, your expression is, I'm not just doing this because the teacher is obligated, it's part of our school rules. No, it's supposed to be because I have a love for God. I'm going to take time out, I'm going to listen to something beneficial, and this is going to make me from those, radiallahu anhum wa radu an, those whom Allah is pleased with because I'm doing what He's asked, and that will give me satisfaction and pleasure in my relationship with Him. But number two, ultimately, people worship out of fear. There's something you and I or others are scared of. And it doesn't matter who you are as a human being, there comes a point where you're at, you know, it's like, oh my God, oh God, help me. And Allah gives this imagery in the Quran that people are on a ship and the, uh, the mawj, the waves begin to cascade on them. They feel that the ship's gonna, uh, gonna uh, submerge and they're gonna die. And at that moment with sincerity, they make dua. They say, oh God, help me. If you save me, I'll be a good person thereafter. There's fear. Uh, God, my, my son, my daughter, my wife, my father, my mother, they're, they're, so, they're unwell. I don't want them, you know, I don't want them to be unwell. I'm going to worship, you know, I'm going to do something. Hopefully God will be able to help me. That's the third level, which is hope. If I do this, if I give this charity, if I go to Hajj, if I, you know, do this thing, then maybe God will help me through this difficult point in my life. When you put all three together, it becomes the best type of worship. When you love, fear, and hope Allah in equal measure, that's the greatest kind of worship, and that's the word taqwa. Write that down. The word taqwa, piety, righteousness, 
The fear of God, the love of God, and the hope in Allah is the best type of unity of worship. Putting all of our worship and focus in our relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we said, Rububiyyah, that we believe God is God. He's the only one who's in charge, who has power. al Hayy, Al-Qayyum, Al-Khaliq, Al-Barik, Al-Musawwib. He's the one who created out of nothing. He's the one who sustains. He's the one who gives, who takes. He's the one who provides. al razzaq And if you believe that, Rububiyyah necessitates and leads to only one conclusion, that there is Uluhiyyah, that he should be the only Ilah. He is the only one who should be worshipped, subhanahu wa ta'ala. And there should be unity of worship. That I focus all of my love, all of my fear, and all of my hope towards that one Rabb, that one supreme being. And therefore Allah tells us, as He advised all of us, and mankind from beginning, Ya ayyuhal nas, in Surah Al-Baqarah, verse 21, the second chapter of the Qur'an, Ya ayyuhal nas, A'budu rabbakum alladhi khalaqakum walladhina min qablikum la'allakum tattakum. O mankind, worship your Lord. So tawheed al-ibadah. Alladhi khalaqakum, because he is the Rabb, he's the creator, and the creator of those who came before you, la'allakum tattaqoon, perhaps you will attain taqwa. And any time Allah speaks about worship, he will link the concept of ibadah with the concept of being the one who is worthy of it. So even when you come to fast, what's the greatest outcome of fasting? La'allakum tattaqoon. I go hungry, I go thirsty, I will do these things to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So how do we define uluhiyya? Allah wants us na'bud rabbana, to worship our Lord alone. Uluhiyya, it means worship, which is to love, hope, and fear in Allah in complete sense. And the meaning of ilah, so who is the one who is worshipped? It means al-ma'bud, the one who is deserving of it, the only one who should be deserving of it. The one who is the object of my love, the object of my fear, the object of my hope. And therefore Allah tells us that when we make this statement, La ilaha, there is no ilah, there is no ma'bud, there is no one I will worship illa Allah, except Allah. We've learned that there is a nafi, a negation of everything. You and I are ordered to disbelieve in everything other than Allah, as much as we are ordered to believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So none is to be invoked. The word invoked means called out to, summoned made dua to, asked for things, except Allah. And none is to be relied upon except Allah. So just say I'm sick, I don't go to the doctor knowing that the doctor is going to heal me, I go to the doctor with the hope that the doctor will be a tool that can be used to heal me, that I can use the medicine, but I know that that doctor, there's other people who have gone to them and they didn't get well. And I know that surgeon who's done that surgery, there are other people who responded well, but others who didn't. That the ultimate lifespan isn't in the doctor's hand, but it's, in my, it's not in my hand, it's in the hand of Allah. I know that there were people who took that chemo, or took that medicine, or took that therapy, and it helped, but there are others who didn't. And therefore the healing is from Allah, my reliance is upon Allah, so although I'm taking medicine, I don't say, well, I don't need to make dua because I took medicine, of course it's gonna work, because that's not how life is. So I'll take the medicine, but I'll do my part through the worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. How insincere of a person to consider, just because I made dua, Allah must answer. No. The dua is a part of the medicine, but the healing is with Allah. It's not the doctor who heals or the medicine who heals, it's the healing in the fate that is fated for me, that I ask Allah to complete for me. And therefore, we don't rely upon anything except Allah. We don't offer sacrifices or make vows except in the name of Allah. So you don't say, I swear on the Kaaba. What's the Kaaba? The Kaaba is meaningless. It's, been, it's, it's made out of stone. It's been built and rebuilt, most recently in the 90s. It's sacred, but it's not the structure. So you would say, وَرَبِّ Kaaba, I swear by the Lord of the Kaaba, that's sacred, that's timeless, that's eternal, that's Allah. You don't say, I swear on my life. What's your life? You're going to live 80, 100 years? 200 years? And then what? 
You pass it. I swear on my eyes. There's many people who have been blessed to not see and live happier lives than those who do see. So why are you swearing with something that's finite that can be given and taken when it's only Allah that you should be making a vow with? So we never make a vow except by the holy names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You can say, I swear on the Lord of the by the Lord of the Quran. I swear by the Lord of the Kaaba. I can make an oath with witness on the Quran. I swear by Allah who has revealed this Quran. You put your hand on the Quran, but it's with Allah's name, not the book, not the Kaaba, not your life or your death. And therefore we don't worship except with the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So now we're going to begin talking about the declaration of faith. And you're going to say, Brother Yahya, we're Muslims, man. We've been Muslim for so long. And we say la ilaha Allah thousands of times in our life by now. Uh, if I was to say to you, here, take this hundred dollars, go across the road. We have a neighbor, she's non-Muslim. Um, a neighbor, he's non-Muslim. Tell him, look, I'll give you a hundred dollars. Say after me, la ilaha Allah. They say, give me the money. And they'll sing it. They'll say it a thousand times. Does it make them Muslim? Is it a key to Jannah for them? Has it changed anything in their life? No. The pronouncement, the statement of la ilaha illallah is meaningless without its conditions. And this is where we need to pay attention. Saying la ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah has conditions. It's not just, oh, I'm, I'm, I declare faith and that's it. It's I declare faith, but now that faith requires me to adhere to a particular mode of thought, to a particular mode of action, to restrictions and fulfillment, things that I'm asked to do, things I'm asked not to do. So let's begin studying the shahada. I want you to circle that word, a shahada. The word shahada comes from shahida, or shahada. To witness means to see something. Outside our door right now, just say we hear a crash. Bang. All of us heard it. We walk outside, there's a student on the floor, and you know, there's another student, they were in a tussle. They were arguing with each other or something. It never happens in our school, but just say. And I come out and Brother Hans says, I, I bring the principal and we go, what happened? I say, did anyone see, did anyone witness it? And we're right next door, it's just right outside their door. Can any of you say, yeah, bro, brother, I, I, I'm a witness? No, you heard. When, when somebody says, did you witness it, what do they mean? They mean, did you see? So what do you witness about Allah? Have you seen Allah? No. Have you seen Muhammad Sallallahu No. Have you seen the revelation of the Quran? Have you seen Jibreel? Have you seen the angels? Have you seen Jannah? Have you seen hellfire? Have you seen punishment in the grave? Have you seen the things that we believe in that are part of the articles of faith? The answer is no. So what are you witnessing? So why are you saying, I, I have the capacity to witness? One of the ways that I show that I'm a witness is I woke up today, 4.25 in the morning, and I made wudu when everybody else on my street is asleep. And I got ready and got my family ready, and we said, Allahu Akbar. And in my wudu, I said, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah. In the adhan that my, my, my boy made, he said, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah. In my salah, at tahiyyatu lillah, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah. Everything in my life declares that I am a fit witness, that I believe in Allah and I disbelieve in everything other than. From what I eat, to what I wear, to how I act, to what I like, to what I hate, everything shows I declare my faith in Allah. And therefore that's really important. So therefore the statement of la ilaha illallah, when you say I witness that there is no God but Allah, because look at my life, my life is a testament, is evidence that there is Allah. In how I lead my life, in how I lead my family, in how I lead my ethics, that will become clear. Why do we do that? What's the blessing of the shahada? Well the first thing I want you to understand, it is the essence of our tawheed. It is the very basis of our faith. So if we have a non-Muslim teacher, as we do sometimes who comes in for relief or as a substitute or as a sub-teacher, and he comes in and goes, look, I had a great time at your school, which is what they usually say. Can you guys tell me a little bit more about what you guys believe? What's, you know, describe, like everything about Islam is, is, is kind of, you know, there's so much. 
but give it to me in one sentence. Uh, summarize the Quran in one sentence. Summarize the life of your Prophet in one sentence. Summarize your belief in one sentence. What's that one sentence? Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wa ashhadu anna Muhammad Rasulullah. Every verse in the Quran comes back to that reality. Every verse in the Quran comes back to that very same thought that I'm not going to worship anything but God and I'm going to put my faith and reliance upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wa anna Muhammadan Rasulullah. And that Muhammad is one of a long list of prophets and he was the last one to come and complete our belief in Allah. The statement of La ilaha illallah is the key to Jannah. The Prophet ﷺ said it is Mithdahul Jannah. <coughs> and every key has, you know, little shards in it. You can't just put any key in Jannah. You can't just put another key in Jannah. That key is cut in a particular way. Nobody entered Jannah without a passport. The Prophet ﷺ said, La yadkhul Jannah ahad illa bi bitafa. Nobody enters paradise without a passport, without a document. Maktub and feed written in it, Bismillahir Rahman Rahim, with the name of Allah, the gracious, the merciful. Adhiru Abdi Jannah and Adiya. Kachahada Anni La ilaha illa ana. Enter the servants of mine into Jannah, because they believed in me and worshipped none but me. On the day of judgment, when our deeds are weighed, all of our bad deeds in one side, and all of the blessings of Allah in that side. So have you been thankful enough to Allah just from this morning, from the time you woke up until now, have you done enough thankfulness to Allah for the vision you've been able to enjoy just for today, just so far? Do you feel that your life is a witness that I'm thankful to Allah for being able to see just for this morning, these last few, four, three or four hours? And I can tell you in my life, I'm hopeful in Allah's mercy, but I'm not hopeful that my good deeds are enough. And the Prophet ﷺ said in the hadith of Imam Muslim, nobody enters Jannah on account of their good deeds. It's only through Allah's mercy that you will enter. So all those things are on one side, they're heavier than the good deeds I will have performed. And then Allah will order, the Prophet ﷺ said that the kalima tayyibah, that the good word, la ilaha illallah, be put, meaning that I chose Allah when it was difficult. That I woke up for my prayers. That I, you know, wore, you know, for the sisters, they wore their hijab, they dignified their parents, they honored themselves, they ate what was halal, they turned away from what was haram, they, you know, kept their eyes pure from prayer, all these things. That word, la ilaha illallah, its conditions, rajuhat. Everything else here is light in comparison to believing in Allah the way you should. So it becomes a passport to enter Jannah. It's a means of forgiveness for one's sins. Prophet Yunus السلام, is a very good example. So Prophet Yunus is a prophet of Allah and Allah said to him, keep calling your people to faith. And they come to faith and you know, call them to faith. Don't give up on them. And when you see that my punishment has arrived, warn them about it. Because I will punish them if they don't come to faith. So after many years, finally, Allah's punishment is about to descend upon the people of Yunus. And Yunus looks up into the sky and it's changed his car and that's it. The sign that Allah is going to destroy them. But Allah has not yet given him permission to leave them. And he says, they're done. And he leaves without Allah's permission. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala shows our Prophet sallam, this good example to say, listen, I don't even need you, Ya Muhammad, to lead these people. When the people of Yunus, illa qawma Yunus, when they saw the punishment of Allah descending, they repented to Allah even without him. And he had already left. So Allah saved them, and then Allah tested Prophet Yunus. As he's in the ship, he was ordered that he be taken overboard. The fish took hold of him and began to drag him underwater. He's going to drown. And as he's being dragged down, he makes the dua of his istighfar. How does he ask Allah for his forgiveness? He says, La ilaha illa Oh Allah, I only worship you. Subhan, glorious are you. Inni kuntu min al-dhalimeen. I wronged myself. He doesn't say, oh Allah, save me. I'm going to drown. Oh Allah, oh Allah. No. La ilaha illallah is the greatest way of asking for forgiveness. It is the greatest way in anger, in happiness, in sorrow, in regret, in repentance. La ilaha illallah. In every moment, in every turn, remind yourself that you're here 
as a servant of God and that you turn away from other than him. That my reliance isn't on my parents. La ilaha illa ant. Only you, O oh Allah. And if my parents aren't here, you'll still look after me, ya Allah. Right? Allah is the center of all affairs. The Prophet ﷺ said, خَيْرُ مَا قَالَ النَّبِيُّونَ The best thing any Prophet ever said, any messenger ever said, any human being ever spoke, is لا إله إلا الله, is that statement that there is none that is worthy, worthy of worship but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It is al-kalima tayyibah, the blessed word. Finally, the kalima, la ilaha illallah, is the highest branch of faith. And I'm going to give you another supplement to the notes that you're already filling in as we're going through. Um, and that'll be for the next screen, inshallah, that we'll, we'll work through. And it's, uh, we're going to study the tree of faith. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Ibrahim, وَمَثَلُ كَلِمَةٍ طَيِّبَةٍ كَشَجَرَةٍ طَيِّبَةٍ أَصْلُهَا ثَابِتٌ وَفَرْحُهَا فِي السَّمَاءِ The example of the believer and the example of faith in Allah is like a blessed, magnificent tree. أَصْلُهَا ثَابِتٌ Its description is its roots are deep in the earth. وَفَرْوَهَا فِي السَّمَاءِ And its stalk and its trunk grows up and reaches into the heavens and its fruits and branches flower all around. Allah juxtaposes that and compares that to an evil tree where its roots are up, uplifted, shallow and diseased, and it's easy to be toppled over. There are three parts to a tree that Allah speaks about. The roots and the base, the trunk that holds it up, and the branches, meaning the fruits that we have. And we're going to recreate that in our notes. I want you to know that as Muslims, it's important for us to reflect upon ourselves in that capacity. How strong is our tree of faith? And where is it rooted? And how deep are the roots of faith in our heart? So there's the tree of faith that you have in your notes, and you're going to add notes to it. We're going to continue through it, inshallah. The tree of faith, it's, you know, most people, when they see the tree, they appreciate the outside of it, you know, the top of it. What, you know, is it a mango tree? Mmm, delicious. Is it, you know, an orange blossom tree and it smells really nice? They look at its size. But really what makes a tree significant is its root structure. And it's what's beneath the surface that is what makes the top and what's above the surface meaningful. In, as we're getting into summer now in Australia, your rose gardens outside your home, right? You're, you might have some rose gardens. In the winter time, what did your mom, your dad, or your gardener do? They went out and they pruned the heck out of them, right? They cut off all the branches and you had this, you used to have this big, bush and now it's this little small rose garden bush but now as summer's coming in with a little bit of water and fertilizer it begins to expand and the flowers begin to bloom when you were fertilizing it where did you put the fertilizer on the stem or on the ground on the ground where did you water it at the top of it or on the ground on the ground. Why? Because it's the roots that anchor what is going to be grown there. It's what is going to absorb the nutrients. It's what's going to funnel in the water. It's what's going to keep that tree healthy. The roots, number one, is equal to the heart of a believer. So my heart is where Iman is supposed to take root. That's where the belief in Allah is supposed to begin. It's from in my heart that I'll begin to do the other actions that will be pleasing to Allah. If I do actions, if I do the flowery things and the fruitful things, without belief in the heart, it's called hypocrisy. It's called nifah. You're doing something outwardly that isn't inside. And nobody wants to be like that. Nobody wants to have that cognitive dissonance where the outside is different to what I know of myself on the inside. So the iman in the heart anchors our actions. Although it is beneath the surface, it is what supplies the rest of the body 
with its energy, nutrients, and strength. If the heart remains healthy, if the roots remain healthy, even when the leaves fall off, even when it's pruned, even when it's lit on fire, if you, you know, we have bushfires and forest fires here in Australia, and all of a sudden you'll, you'll, you know, I remember Pemberton three or four years ago it was, you know, there was a massive forest fire. We went the next year and it was back. You know, there was still a little bit of charred remains of some trees, but the trees that were healthy and its roots were deep, they regrew. The outside kind of got burnt and crisp, but it all fell off, and all of a sudden, the shoots grew again. If it remains healthy underground, where it's not seen, where only Allah knows what's in the heart, if it remains healthy there, even when the trunk is attacked, even when the leaves have fallen, even when there's little sign of life on the outside, it can regrow with strength. That's a believer. Nothing in life takes away iman out of your heart. Whatever difficulty, whatever Allah's cut out of your life, whatever's been taken from you, whatever fire damage has happened, your roots in your heart, there's faith in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now that's not enough on its own because a tree isn't a tree if you just look at roots. You call that, what is that? There's no tree there. Tree, it can't just be roots, it's gotta regrow and there's gotta be a stem, there's gotta be a trunk. There's got to be a stalk, something that is powerful and holds up what will grow on it. And the second part of the tree is the trunk, the stalk, the stem. It's the actions of the body which are the proof of Islam in the heart. So if I have Iman in the heart, I can't say, oh, I'm good inside and that's enough. No, I've got to prove my faith. And I've got to witness my testimony of faith in Allah. The five pillars hold up. The five pillars, and that's why we call them pillars, because they hold up the structure of Islam. The five pillars, the shahada, salah, suyam, zakah, hajj, they're what hold up faithfulness and prove what is in the heart. The regular practice of my Islam strengthens the tree and makes the roots grow further. So if I don't, have a, a, a you know a, a big stalk. The assumption is my roots haven't having continued to grow. So for me to continue to grow the roots and to continue to supply nutrients, I need to branch out to get more energy, more oxygen, more CO2, all of those things that are going to help this tree to grow and make the roots grow deeper. So for the roots to continue growing, I have to have actions on the outside. It's a proven statement that if you cut at something at the top of a tree, it actually is felt in the roots and they absorb more water, they absorb more nutrients. They react to it and say, we need to conserve more energy to grow even greater. You would have studied some of that in biology. Third and finally, the branches or the fruits of the tree is our righteous conduct, our ihsan. It's what beautifies us. It's what makes us fragrant. It's what we want to look at and see in others and find in ourselves. It makes me happy when I've done something that is righteous. I want to be a person who fasts. I want to be a charitable person. I want to be kind and happy and smiley and generous and forgiving. Those are the fruits of the faith that is deep down in my heart. So faith blooms only with strong roots and a solid, healthy stalk and trunk. Every so often, the leaves and the fruits are picked. And every so often, our sins cut away our branches. Maybe I used to pray at night, but you know, I began to do this thing that was haram, so Allah took away my night prayers. Maybe I used to pray two rak'ah before Fajr, and now I don't even pray Fajr, because that nice, it's cut away. Now the stalk is being injured. Sometimes I get cut, I get pruned by the difficulties of life, by the shaitan's influence, by my sinful soul. I disfigure my tree of faith, but it can regrow again and again if my roots are watered, and if my actions are pleasing to Allah.
The Prophet ﷺ said, سِبْتُونَ أَوْ سَبْعُونَ شُعْبَةً مِنْ الْإِمَانِ There's 70 different avenues, 70 different branchings of faith. All of them are pleasing to Allah. The best of them is the shahada, the witnessing of faith. أَشْهَدُ أَنْ لَا إِلَهِ إِلَّا اللَّهِ وَأَشْهَدُ أَنَّ مُحَمَّدَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ الْكَلِمَ لَا إِلَهِ إِلَّا اللَّهِ is the best, it's the height of the tree. It's the thing that is most beautiful of all of this. It's that gem, it's the thing that you want to beautify your tree with, that you can say, look at my faith in Allah, is unshakable. And therefore, to witness faith is one of the magnificent parts and parcels of our iman. This is an important um, discussion, and it will be on your final exam at the end of the year. Make sure that you've taken ample good notes and you can go back to hearing this and watching it later, inshallah. How do we define the word ilah? Well, we said that the word ilah is Abdullah ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu, he said, it is ilah is the one whom things turn to in worship. Who we turn to in worship. So for some people, their ilah is their own soul. They love things so much, they love their desires. So it's like they worship it. They worship the almighty dollar. For some people, they worship status and fame. They'll do anything just to get attention. For some people, they worship deities and objects out of love or fear or hope. For us, our ilah is only Allah. And therefore, the correct meaning of the shahada is ashhadu an la ilaha illallah. There is no God or deity that is worthy of worship. It's not just there is no God but Allah. There is no God or deity worthy of worship. The worthy of worship part is the emphasis in our shahada. And that's why when you say ashhadu an la ilaha, there's shadda on the weakness statement. Ashhadu, it's shadda, requires a stress. Allah ilaha, that there is no God or deity worthy of worship. And then the last part, illallah, flows, there's no stress. It's meant to be facilitated and easy. If you disbelieve in all these other things other than Allah, it becomes easy to recognize Allah. And therefore we have an acceptance and a rejection. We reject everything other than Allah. To us only Allah, all others are to be ignored, disbelieved in, and rejected in terms of worship. So there's no, oh I'm going to worship Allah, but I'm just going to hedge my chances on something else, so I'm going to worship other things along with it. We don't worship other than Allah, and put our hope and our love and our trust in other than Allah. And number two, our acceptance of Allah is that we praise Him, worship Him alone, at the exclusion of all others. Now we need to come to some of the conditions. Uh, because over here, I want you to know that sometimes Muslims do crazy things. And not because a person was raised as a Muslim, or that they came into Islam, that they've abandoned some of the things that have been absorbed culturally into Islamic traditions. And they are not part of Islam and are condemnable in Islam. So let me get, and I don't mean, you know, I'm not picking on any one culture. But every one of our cultures, wherever you guys are all from, wherever I'm from, we have certain things that have crept into the practices of Muslims in certain regions that have nothing to do with Islam. I remember I was invited to a, a, a I'll begin with Indians. Not that I'm upset with India, I love India. <laughs> I went to a Muslim Indian wedding and I was shocked. They had like the fire ritual and they had things that are directly taken out of Hindu customs. And then I went to a Pakistani wedding and I was surprised. I was like, whoa, what's happening with these Pakistanis? I love me some Pakistanis and biryani and all that, but what's happening here? The, wa the woman is the one who gives the dowry to the man. That the mahr, it's not the man who gives, but the woman is also her family is expected to give. That's the opposite of Islam. Then you go see the Turks, Egyptians, Arabs. They, some of them, they have this false concept. So they'll come, they'll, you'll get into a car, and they'll have ayat al kursi, and under it, it'll have the nazar bead. Do you know the nazar? What does it look like? You know, there's blue, and then it's got a little yellow there. 
Yeah, where does that come from? Well, that's the eye of Zeus. So if you were to speak to a Greek, they'll tell you, oh, that's the eye of Zeus. They're not going to tell you it's like... Because that comes from the false belief that Zeus, that Hellenistic Greek god of so long ago, that if you felt people were going to be jealous and looking at you, you'd pray to Zeus and his eye would look after you. And that's where that comes from. They added Ayatul Kursi with the eye of Zeus. And they'll put it on their children on a gold thing and be like, oh, mashallah, my son is protected. So that little thing you're wearing, that, that protecting your son, that's the thing that's going to protect your son? You're like, no, that's not Islam. That has nothing to do with Islam. Then you go to another culture where, where are my Malays at? Singaporean, Malays, Indonesian. You're like, whoa, four-day weddings. And they got all these little rituals and... Like, where do you get all this stuff? Where do they have some of the traditions that have come are not from Islamic traditions. They're from the culture. Some of them are acceptable, but others come from a paganistic perspective. From a perspective that came from the remnants of shirk that existed. And therefore it becomes very important for us to have our reliance on Allah. When we say I rely on Allah, I don't rely on that blue dot. I don't put that on, on my uh, front door. I don't put that on my, uh, in my business and say, you know, now Allah's going to protect me, uh, but just in case. I got that blue dot, right? It's not a part of our faith. Our faith, even as Muslims, our faith isn't to write Ayat al-Kursi on the wall and say, okay, now the house is protected. It's that you have Ayat al-Kursi in calligraphy in your home so that you see it and recite it so it reminds you to ask Allah for his protection. It's not the writing on the wall that protects you. It's you believing in Allah that can lead to that protection. And therefore we accept Allah and what Allah brought and what Muhammad Sallallahu brought. One day there was a woman, and I want you to see this. Uh, there was a woman, she had a bangle. And she was wearing it, she came to the Prophet Sallallahu And that bangle had been made for her, it's cool. It had been made for her uh, by one of the older soothsayers, you know, magicians of Quraysh. And the Prophet said, Man hada? What is this? She said, Oh, this was something that I, you know, an amulet. And it... He said, The people who believe in Allah don't wear things like this. So she broke it because it was so tight. She said, Oh, I can't even take it off. I've gained weight and all. So she broke it and then she ordered that it be given in charity. Right? The Prophet said, that the one who believes in a khiyara, who believes in the superstitious practice of bird sighting. Back then they would see, oh my God, a black crow landed on the doorstep of my home. I'm not going out today. Something bad's going to happen. It's like you find in culture today, Friday the 13th, or a black cat looked at me through the mirror. Like, oh, just say you have, like, just say you're walking and a black cat is looking into that window and you look in the window and the black cat's eyes are in the window and looking at you, oh my God, right? Or, oh my God, you walked under a ladder, you're dead, right? Even some of the content that you find, oh, break a leg. They would say that to actors and actresses, people going on the stage, they would say to them, break a leg. Why does it, it's like a weird thing to say. Like somebody's going on stage and say, Break a leg from if I want. You should say, you know, wish me luck. Uh, you know, they, they, it's their way of wishing luck. How? By saying break a leg, it means that I hope you don't break a leg, so I'm going to say it so that you don't think I'm like giving you nazar. You know what I mean? So I'm just going to say it in that way. Or knock on wood. What's knock on wood mean? Where does that come from? Because it's like that, you know, it's that sound, something's hollow, something that, uh, I don't want anything from you, right? It comes from Christian doctrine as well. You know, uh, cross your fingers. It comes from the belief in the cross. So the, the you know, people, they, they have that as a, as a concept, right? It shows like, you know, God's going to help me through this, right? So a lot of the things that we see, some of them are condemnable that we don't believe in. I, I know some of it is just general vernacular, but some of the things that have come into our tradition, we should be very, very careful with, right? As Muslims. Let's talk about the conditions of our shahada. What do we mean when we say we believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? And this is where we're gonna continue the next time we meet, right?
So the next time we meet, we're going to talk about how do I know if my life gives witness to my belief in Allah? Am I a person who, who believes in La ilaha illallah in the way it should be believed in? Is La ilaha illallah meaningful to me? And I'll run you through you know, the seven, and we're going to talk about them, inshallah, in detail the next time. So the first seven are things that we do. We must have knowledge of Allah. You can't believe in La ilaha illallah just by saying, and you don't know who is this God, who is Allah that you're worshiping. You need to know about his names and his attributes. You need to know about his revelation and his prophets and messengers. You need to become acquainted with him. You need to have general knowledge. But that's not enough. That must extend to you being certain that what I know about Allah is unshakable. That the questions that I've had, the things that have come to mind, that I've asked the knowledge that has made me certain. So I had a thought in my mind and I, you know, I know about Allah, but this question keeps nagging at me. No, I need to get the answer for it to find certainty. And certainty in the heart is where doubt has been removed. So anytime you have a question, your requirement is to seek its answer. I'm always open to hear your questions. Other, other um, people around you are always um, happy to receive your questions. Don't ever have a question in your heart that isn't answered and you leave it. Because it remains there and other people can manipulate it to lead you away from Allah when that was never your intent. Number three, acceptance. And that's really important. It's one thing that you just say, you know, there's something in my life that I'm not doing. Just say, you know, subhanAllah, somebody's struggling to wake up for Fajr. They pray much Allah, the other four prayers, but Fajr, if they say, well, listen, that's just how I am. Uh, look, Allah's just going to have to accept me as I am. I don't accept the fact that I have to wake up for Fajr. Or, look, we live in, in this, you know, I got to get to work, I got to get to school on a certain time. It's inconvenient. I'm just going to pray it when I wake up. And you rejected the instruction of Allah. It might be, oh, no, hijab, I'll never wear it. Never. That's stupid. It's an Arabic thing. It has nothing to do with, I'm just going to be a decent person. I'm ne I reject it. So when you have a rejection of what Allah has said, it's different to saying, inshallah, I hope to. Inshallah, I know this is from Allah. It's something that I'm happy with. Uh, but I'm not doing it at the moment, and inshallah, I hope to. That's very different to rejecting it altogether. Number four, submission. You can't just accept and say, I accept it, but I'll never do it. You have to come and try to comply to as much as what Allah said. And that's the key. These two words are the key to sami'na wa ata'na. We hear means we accept. Wa ata'na means we submit to try to practice it. Number five, to do it truthfully. Don't do it because I expect it or your parents expect it. Don't stand in, don't come up to the prayer just because it's a school rule. It has to be truthful between you and Allah. Number six, it's gotta be sincere. Once you're truthful with Allah, then you become sincere, meaning it becomes out of love and fear and hope in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the final thing that is requested of your worship and your belief in Allah is that it is done with love for Allah and love for His creation. Everything comes back to love. Those seven are the things we do, and the last two are things we don't do. So we deny worshipping. We don't worship anything other than Allah. And finally, we do that until our death surprises us. Those nine conditions, if you gather them together and approach Allah with them, you are from those who have been given the key to Jannah. And you are from those who will have that passport. The one who gets his book in his right hand. The passport in the right hand. I always knew I was going to do well. Read my book, I'm going to Jannah. Other people, they get in their left, and they're scared to, they know they're not making it. Why? Because they don't have the conditions of La ilaha illallah. Muhammad Rasulullah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us ease and success. Allahumma ameen. And I'll see you again next time with another installment. Assalamu alaikum.